Hey there, folks. We're gonna build a brand new Game Boy with all aftermarket parts. How cool is that gonna be? All right, so if you frequent my channel, um, this is probably not your first time hearing about this thing. Uh, let's start with this baggie here where we've got the, uh, got the brains of the business going on. So in the first bag here, I have the motherboard of our brand new Game Boy. Uh, now, like I said, this is 100% aftermarket. Everything on here is off the shelf parts or parts that Funny Playing has made custom for this device. Um, even the cart slot. And it is my understanding that they will be putting the cart slots up for sale at some point. Um, though, as of the time of filming, Today is not that day. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it just looks like a regular Game Boy Color motherboard, except you might notice a few key differences. Um, the biggest of which is that it doesn't have a Game Boy Color CPU on there. There is just a big old quad flat pack here. Um, this is a Goin FPGA. Um, it does all the magic. It replaces the Game Boy CPU uh, via hardware emulation. Uh, now, I know, I know, it's an FPGA. FPGAs are not emulation, blah, 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 but, but really they are. They're, they're emulating the hardware that they replace. Um, that's not to say that emulation is bad. Bad emulation is bad, but good emulation is, is good. And from what I've seen so far, this is pretty good. There's, there's still some ways to go, but we'll get there in the end. Uh, but anyway, this looks almost identical to the um, the hardware prototypes that I've shown off previously. The first one I showed off did not have the ability to update it, and thus it was missing this microcontroller here. Um, but the second prototype that I've shown off, I even put it in that snazzy um, cyberpunk-themed shell. Um, as far as I can tell, the, the, the two boards are identical. So this is retail hardware, except that mine doesn't have the little version 1.0 tag on the silk screen. Um, so yeah, if you want to take a look at how this thing has been progressing, there's videos going to, there's going to be videos linked in the description. Uh, but if you don't care about any of that, let's get the show on the road. Um, so you need the motherboard. But when you buy the motherboard, it also comes with a brand new speaker, a lithium ion battery, and the uh, screen assembly here. So this screen assembly is a laminated, um, what I call a Q5 display. Uh, it is called that because the display is literally just the same LCD out of a BlackBerry Q5. So if you ever wondered, that's why it's called that. Um, similarly, tangent, the slate screens, we call 9380s because those are, you guessed it, out of a BlackBerry 9380. But anyway, that's, uh, that's unrelated. Anyway. Uh, so the lens on this screen compared to their normal Game Boy Color backlight kits, um, there's basically a, a much smaller bezel and no logo, no power LED cutout, no nothing. It's just, it's just plain black. And here's what that bad boy looks like powered up. That's all you get, which neither here nor there, but, um, while we're at it, let's go off on a very quick tangent. Uh, because the bezel is smaller, this console uses, uh, makes use of more of the screen area that we weren't using before with uh, other backlight Q5 kits. Let me grab an example here. Oh, oh my God, I was worried I didn't have it. Okay, so. Here is, 
conveniently, also another funny playing kit, but this one's in an actual Game Boy Color. So you can see the bezels are quite a bit smaller on the replacement console and there is no logo, but if you're not about the uh, uneven scaling, because this is not using integer scaling in this mode, you can also just come in here and change the display over to the X4 mode and, oops, that was weird. And it's the exact same size and position as one of their normal, um, I guess these batteries are basically dead. Um, well, that's weird, they're joogies. I don't know why I'd be doing that. That's besides the point, I'll figure that out later. Um, but the point is, it's the same size and shape and placement as the normal Q5 lenses if you want to get a replacement with a logo on it. Now keep in mind, if you stick with the funny playing one, um, their kits are all designed to uh, have the logo illuminated so there's no print on the lens. Um, this is not compatible with those lens per se. You can use them, the logo just won't be illuminated. There are other lenses, um, one of my buds picked one up off of AliExpress, I'll link it in the description, it's the AliExpress link in there. I don't know of any other vendors that sell this type of laminated display with the, um, with the logo but without the, the transparent, yeah, I don't know. It linked in the description, whatever, doesn't matter. Tangent, let's get back to the uh, main focus here. Um, so these four things all come together. Let's take a look at this battery here. It should be the exact same battery that they use in both the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance battery mod um, kits. Except in this case, you don't need a battery mod, you just plug the battery straight into the motherboard here, just like that. I will plug that in in a moment when we're a little bit more ready to test. And last but not least on this board here is this brand new speaker with its own little silicon ring. Silicon ring. Um, don't lose this, make sure you install it, otherwise your speaker's gonna rattle around in your shell. It just goes right over the top of the, oh my goodness. It just goes right over the top of the speaker, just like that. And then, it does not come with this, but you'll also probably want one of these. A shell for the whole, for the whole deal. Um, I also forgot to set aside membranes and buttons, so I'm gonna have to pause at some point and go grab those. Uh, but it's just, at this point, you can just use regular Game Boy Color stuff. You don't need any of the, the specialty hardware. Um, but no, we've only purchased two things so far, the, the kit and then a shell. In this particular case, I wanted the blue one. Uh, so the fronts of these shells, if I can get this Jesus thing open. Ugh. So the front portion of this shell is identical to their laminated Game Boy Color um, shells. There is not a single difference with this portion of the shell. So if you have one that you want to reuse, like for instance, maybe something UV printed, um, you'll be good to go. The screen just drops right in the same as any other Q5 display and it just works. But the back is where things are a little bit more different. Uh, so they still have, you know, all the all the styling and logos. What happened to my autofocus, man? What's going on here? Um, and the battery bay, you still have all the double A battery markings. Uh, note, because we are using this with a lithium ion battery, if yours comes with the springs pre-installed, they shouldn't be, but some of them did. Um, remove those before you install the battery. It's probably not going to ruin anything, but you also probably aren't going to have a good time regardless. Um, you have a lot more room if you pop them out. To pop those bad boys out, you'll need like a little sharp tool, like some steel tweezers or something. You just stick it in this hole on the back and there's a little tab that you release and then you can just slide the whole unit out. Um, 
nice and easy since this thing is not compatible with double A's. Uh, we just want this little battery contact doodad out of there. But anyway, let's move on. On the back of the shell, one of the modifications is instead of having a DC jack, you have the uh, little USB type C cut out there. And that's pretty much it as far as the differences go between this shell and the normal laminated shell. Um, if you want to, you can certainly cut your own uh, hole in there. I do have a jig for Game Boy Color shell cuts, but it does not fit this alignment. Um, I'll have to up see about updating that and re-releasing it if you want to carve out your own shell. But in the meantime, you can also just get the one that Funny Playing has that's already molded. And then you can see here, they even put the text on the edge of the shell there. It's kind of uninspired. They had this whole space to work with and they just put USB-C. Whereas on their OEM Game Boys, they even had a little polarity diagram. Maybe, is that gonna? That's not coming out. Clear shell woes. Um, but whatever, if you have a Game Boy Color, you just grab it, you look at the bottom, and uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. All right, the shell comes with screws and a little IR window. You'll need both of these, though unfortunately this hardware does not currently support IR hardware. You can see that they made room on the board for the components, but then just straight never installed them. Um, I'd, ha I'd hazard a guess saying... If you were to plug, if you were to populate all these components, it still wouldn't work. I bet the code is not done for that. Uh, but anyway, let's move on. Start the actual install, why don't we? And how about you start auto-focusing? Thanks, bud. Okay. So first thing, I believe we're going to want to test this. Make sure that everything is working. These boards should come from the factory or from wherever you buy them from, pre-flashed and they should already have uh, working firmware on there. So to test this out, I'm gonna go ahead and get this speaker plugged in, if I can. Look at that, you don't even need to solder it. It just plugs right into that connector. Boom. This ring is going to fall off, so I'm just going to set it there for now. Uh, we will also want the battery for testing. I have not checked to see whether this has any charge or not. Just plug that right in there, maybe. Wow, that's wild. I guess there's a little bit of flashing on the end of mine. It's not fitting properly. Okay. Sometimes these things happen, but that's still annoying. remnant from the plastic injection molded phase. And look at that, fits great now. We'll just set that right there, flip that over, and let's see if it makes noise, huh? And indeed it does. So it's probably working. But let's plug in the screen just to double check. Um, it is the same Q5 screen that they use in the Game Boy Color kits, like I said, just with the different lens. But instead of the normal Game Boy Color backlight kit ribbon, they have this little custom doodad here. Um, all it is is an adapter to plug this screen into this board without having to inconvenience yourself during assembly. Um, there is nothing to this ribbon. There's no components, no nothing. All it does just lets you plug it in just like that. That slides in there. It's a little difficult to get it seated, but we'll be okay, I think. 
I'm gonna hold this up, make sure that the um, big old copper strip along the bottom does not short up against anything on this on this board. I'm gonna switch it on. And as you can see, my Game Boy, my Game Boy, my, um, my FPGA console seems to be booting right up and seems to have no issues here. Uh, just a quick visual inspection of the screen. I don't see any weird, um, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't see anything weird. I don't see any uh, water damage, dead pixels, cracks, whatever. Um, unfortunately, it is not set to full screen, so I have a little bit more inspection to do, but it's kind of inconvenient to do now, so we'll not do that. We'll just make sure that it actually boots games too. And it's probably good. Do I have enough capacitance? No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. See, all seems well. So now we can go ahead and continue with the uh, install. I'm gonna go ahead and unplug this battery again. Set that off to the side. I won't be needing it for quite a while. Unplug the screen. I'm gonna unplug it by the ribbon just because this is a little bit easier to get to than this most of the time. And uh, yeah, I think we're good. Um, now I'm just gonna go pause and grab some buttons and membranes. I'll be right back. All right, I've got all these fun button sets from my friend and I always forget to use them. Um, so these are an older set of machined loom aluminum buttons from uh, Retro CNC. And I've been saving them. I don't know for what, but I think I've been saving them for this. But one of the, one of the neat things about these buttons from Retro CNC is the start and select buttons themselves are also machined. Uh, so you have to take a regular membrane here and then just cut off the silicone tops to it so that you still have the little contact pads. Uh, and then you just install that behind your buttons and then you have nice, solid, clicky, well, not clicky, but clicky-er buttons. Uh, two came out of that box. Are you kidding me? I don't know how this happens. My hands haven't even left the frame. <laughs> okay, whatever, whatever. So that bad boy goes in, Ooh, just like that. And we can slip that membrane in there. Um, just cut it with flush cutters, nice and easy. And then, once we've got that installed, eh? Eh? I like it. I think it's good. Um, now, excuse me how it, while I figure out what the heck happened to that button. Aha! Can't fool me. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and get all of our Tons installed. Not sure if I'm feeling the blue on blue yet. I think it'll be good. I think I also should have thought about this a little bit more in advance and um, bought different membranes. Okay. So with the buttons installed, I'm gonna reinstall, ooh, be careful with the speaker around screws, because, you know, speakers are magnetic. All right, reinstall the boot. The insulating gasket. I don't know if it's an insulating gasket or a spacer or what. I'm pretty sure it's, well, both, because that fits nicely in there. 
In fact, actually, I wonder if it's easier to install the boot first and then slip the speaker into it. Just make sure that the uh, boot, the little silicon jacket, is not pinched. Maybe? What's going on here? There we go. And then with that installed there, we haven't installed the screen yet. Uh, come in here. should come with three short screws and then six long screws. I'm gonna take two of the short screws here. Wait, that's not where that goes. But yeah, it is. Oh, I know why it's not fitting funny. My speaker's positioned funny. So before I do that, there's a little, there's a little, um, I don't know, the edge of the speaker here is uh, sticking out under the board, so I need to physically turn the speaker. Probably is designed so that the uh, logo faces upright. Huh? No, actually that's not it. It needs to be about 45 degrees, and then it clears. And you hear that snap as it snapped right in? Oh yeah. Everything's going according to plan. Let me swap bits. So I had the wrong size. All right. And because we are threading into plastic, um, metal screws into plastic injection molded shells. The screw posts are never threaded from the factory. That's just not how the technology works. Um, it takes a little bit more effort to get the screws started, uh, but once you have them fully installed for the first time, subsequent reinstalls are a little bit easier. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. All right, I'll take it back, I'm into it. Gotta be a setting for autofocus. I'm gonna have to play with that later. All right, now that we have this together, I did already test my screen, so I am good to go to install it. Um, I don't think we need to do anything else on the inside of this thing. I think we can just button it up and go from here. There is no power LED on these whatsoever. There is still the hole in the injection molded shell but there's just nothing on the board, so it's just an empty hole. Um, in my opinion, it's pretty obvious when these things are on and when they're off, so you don't really need a power LED. And once we've got it assembled, in the OSD there is a battery indicator, so it's not like you don't get any feedback. and get this installed. It is significantly easier the first time around to get the motherboard in first and then get the screen installed, but once you've got this adhesive backing peeled up, things change a little. So with that peeled up, I am going to position this so that I'm holding onto the screen itself and the ribbon. Then I'm going to try and slide that ribbon in there. 
and then close the bail just like that. Make sure the ribbon is fully inserted. I know these ones in particular can be kind of fiddly. Um, I don't really like the connector that Funny Playing used on this side, but it is what it is. With that plugged in, we can uh, slip that under and then drop the screen into place. I didn't have it all the way inserted and then the adhesive started grabbing on and well I didn't want to get fingerprints all over it so I settled for a giant circle right in the middle where the suction cup hit it. But huh? Huh? Things are coming along. Now we need the IR window. Just goes right there. It's effectively just something to fill a hole in a shell, and I need a power switch because I forgot to grab one. Okay. One note, these switches inside the console itself, they are double throw. So you hear there's a, um, it moves down, Let's see, I have it all the way at the top, clicks down into the middle, and then it moves all the way to the bottom. Uh, the Game Boy Color Shell already has a detent right in the middle, so if you install this switch, and you think the uh, overlapping detents are a little bit weird, which, I don't know, I guess it feels fine, me doing this right now. Um, I don't know, if you don't like it, Cut the detent off of uh, the little plastic slider power switch and try it again. It might feel a little bit better for you. Um, that's what I did on this one. And yeah, you can still click it over into the middle option even though that doesn't do anything, but it works when you click it on still. I'm gonna leave the detent because I don't know, I wanna try it the other way, make sure I'm not insane. I am also leaving this third screw out right here. Uh, normally, you've got the two screws on the outside and then one screw right in the middle. We can install this screw. There's nothing wrong with that. However, on some of these older revision shells, which shouldn't be the case for any of the USB type C cutout ones, um, there is not a corresponding uh, recess in the battery cover for that screw, and so it puts a little bit of extra pressure on the front of the shell and could cause it to crack. Um, the easy solution is to just omit the screw entirely. It doesn't seem to affect the feel that much. Um, but one thing you can do if you really do want to install it, you need to make sure that the screw is fully seated, not over tightened. If you over tighten it, you'll have the exact same symptom, even though it's the opposite problem, um, and you'll crack the front of your shell. So it can't be over tightened, but it has to be perfectly tightened, otherwise it's gonna hit the back of the shell and you're gonna have a bad time. So easiest workaround, just leave it out and then you don't have to deal with it. <laughs> All right. that on there. And is that the right size? Shockingly it is. I think Funny Playing changed their screws again. Which, good for them, this is the correct size this time. Again, just going to install this until it bottoms out and then back it up a quarter turn. We're not tightening. If your screw is under any tension, you're not doing it right. The screw is much stronger than the plastic. It will break the plastic.
right, and with our last screw installed, we're good to go to install the battery too. Uh, look for the orientation on the connector. Mine was upside down with how the wire was creased, but I just creased it the other way. Get it lined up and then pop it in. Do not use tweezers. The contacts are exposed and tweezers being metal. Well, you could short that out, but with a plastic spudger, I can just pop it right in. Uh, I think it makes sense to, how do we do this? A lot of extra wire and I don't think it's supposed to go under the battery. But now that we have the spring removed, there is space to just pop it in there. All right. I believe Funny Playing's solution to this next problem is to, oh, out of focus. I'm sorry, guys. I believe Funny Playing's solution to this next problem is to just tape the battery into the shell. I don't like that. Um, if you've ordered one of these things or any other backlight kit in the past and you've received it in like a plastic box with um, foam, just cut a small chunk of foam out of that and just stick it right on the back of the battery. I did that on this one here. And what that does is that just helps prevent the battery from rattling around in the shell. <laughs> and doing that. <laughs> Um, that was not in there at all, was it? Let's try that again. I'm thinking that one was user error, but hopefully there's no defects here. Coil up the excess. There we go. Now it's tapped in, but you hear how that rattles? That ain't great. I don't like that. Um, it is kind of par for the course since they're using largely stock shells, but with battery mods. But little square foam, doesn't even have to be adhered. Problem gone. Easy peasy. And when it comes time to take this thing apart, you know, just be cognizant of the foam. Oh, there's a little bit of adhesive on mine, so it's gonna stick down. Uh, but just remember to reinstall it and you should be good to go. Um, my foam is a little bit tall, so it's pushing the battery door out but that's an easy fix. Just shave the foam down until it fits. But we don't need to do that. We're all done here. So once we've got this thing assembled, go ahead and press in the volume wheel on the left. This is now a rotary encoder instead of a knob. It's a different type of knob. Um, so it tilts up and it tilts down and you can press it in. Tilt up, Increases volume, tilt down, decreases volume, or do I have that backwards? No, it's the shell that's backwards. The labeling on the shell, oh, those monsters. But that's kind of reminiscent to how original Game Boys were, where you spun the wheel down to get more volume, spin the wheel up to get less volume. This is the opposite. Um, so now you go up, to get less volume, or more volume, excuse me. I've already got it backwards. And then down to get less volume, just like that. But besides volume, everything else you need to control from the OSD. Uh, so we have several different options here. We have backlight brightness, up and down. Um, you can also adjust the volume with the face buttons A and B here. Uh, next option, DISP is display. That changes the display modes of the screen. Uh, out of the box, mine came with X4. 
but we should also have X4P, which adds a pixel grid mode, uh, kind of like the Game Boy Color backlight kits, but like for the actual Game Boy Colors. I don't know if you can see that very well. Um, unfortunately, you've only got the one pixel grid option. A uh, Game Boy, Co a funny playing kit in a Game Boy Color gives you more options than this one does, unfortunately, but hopefully that'll change in the future. And then the last option is the full screen display where we use a little bit more of the display area for a larger image, though now the image is no longer integer scaled. In my personal opinion, it doesn't make that big of a difference in most games, but if you're playing something text heavy, which it's Game Boy Color, a lot of things are pretty text heavy, um, you'll probably notice a lot of the uneven scaling. Uh, and yeah, just the three options. A note on these three options, by the way, um, if you're the type to explore the different firmware versions, which we'll get into the, more about that later, uh, but if you do, pay attention to your display settings because there used to be a fourth option that was enabled in older firmware versions. If you have that option enabled, that, that specific screen palette set, um, and then you swap your console over to a newer firmware version, it will bug out your um, your display and then your display won't work. You'll have to roll back the firmware. But, here we go. This is an older version here. We've got full screen with pixel grid. That's what's missing. And um, I don't know, you, you might be looking at this on the, the Game Boy title screen and thinking, man, I'm kind of bummed I didn't get that. Uh, but with the uneven scaling of the full screen mode, it's extremely noticeable with the pixel grid emulation. So the fact that they've taken away that option, like it, it was my least favorite of the four. And not just because I don't like pixel grids, um, which I don't really like the pixel grid emulation, but that's neither here nor there. I think it just looked bad with this display mode. So no big deal that they've removed it. I I'm going to set that back to full because that is one of the biggest benefits as long as you're um, okay with that setting on this bad boy. Next option, core. We have Game Boy Color and then Game Boy. So I'm going to set that to Game Boy. I'm going to save the options and I'm going to reset the console. And you see now it looks a little bit more like a original Game Boy console or Game Boy Pocket with the, with the logo dropping in from the top. Um, if we put an actual game in there, you see now it's an actual Nintendo logo instead of just the R. And then it'll boot up the game and you'll be able to play uh, as if you were playing off an original Game Boy. There is no color. Um, original Game Boys didn't have color. But this specific game is original Game Boy compatible, so it doesn't really matter. And... Everything kind of just works like you'd expect it as long as you're using it with original games. Uh, now, it is worth noting, you cannot switch cores on the fly. So if I set this to Game Boy Color and save the option, like it's still, it was already booted in Game Boy mode and in Game Boy mode it stays until you reboot it. But I could just turn it off, flip it back on, and now it reboots in Game Boy Color mode. And now I can play my game with color. It is worth noting um, that some games, in particular original Game Boy games, so those are going to be the uh, gray carts, um, stuff like this, though I don't think this is one of the bugged games. Um, original Game Boy carts tend to work better under the Game Boy Core mode, whereas Game Boy Color games obviously require the Game Boy Color mode. But if you have a game that works on both, generally the Game Boy Core works a little bit better than the Game Boy Color Core. Um, there is another option related to this. We'll, we'll circle back to these two options here in a second. But GBC Display, um, we switched that between GB and GBC. I'm not 100% sure what it's changing. Um, but it does change some things in some games. Like you notice now my flowers are no longer in color, but all of, well, nothing's in color except for my sprites. 
what that option does is it changes how the sprites are rendered internally or it changes how everything else is rendered internally except for the sprites i'm not 100 percent sure uh, but in some games pokemon silver is not one of those in some games you do have bug sprites and you need to switch that option over unfortunately it's not automatic it's kind of you know you, you play with it there's any number of options some might work better for other games and, and so on um but in the case of Pokemon Silver, you probably want it on GBC Core and GBC Display Mode. But this is the thing. Uh, like, remember when I mentioned just a few minutes ago how original Game Boy Mo games tend to work better under the Game Boy Core versus the Game Boy Color Core? If you want to use the Game Boy Color Core anyway, this is probably the option that you might need to flip back and forth. This is a global option, so if I'm playing a game that requires it, and then I switch to a game that does not require it, I have to turn it off and then save my settings. And then when I switch back to the first game, I have to turn it back on and save my set it, every single time. There's, it's, it's game agnostic as it were. Anyway, let me go ahead and switch that back to the Game Boy Core and we'll reset that and I'll show you some more of the options here. Alright, so now that we're in game, you see I have this nice green pea soup filter on. That's what this P-A-L-T option or palette option is. We can change between Funny Playing's 30-something presets, I think it is. Oh, 23 now. I might be thinking of something else. Um, the first few presets are, you know, Black and white for the first one, um, Olive for like DMG, original Game Boy emulation, um, a different color green in case that first one doesn't suit your fancy, third one is more like Game Boy Light emulation, uh, fourth one also Game Boy Light emulation, just again slightly different color, um, five, same deal. and. I guess so on. Um, at this point though, you're just hitting different shades. Uh, no original Game Boy does that. Uh, unfortunately, the colors are not programmable. In Game Boy mode, you only have white, black, light gray, and dark gray. And so this is just dynamically remapping those four colors into dark red, light red, black, and pink, you know? Um, unfortunately, it's not programmable like it is on some of the other kits. But if you're into these sort of things, there's probably enough, there's probably a preset that you'll be happy with, I think. Um, I'm gonna set that to, actually really like five. Okay, and now I'm gonna save this and turn it off and then I'm gonna swap games and we'll talk about that very last option there. I'm gonna plug in Zass, my favorite test game. And we're gonna go over the um, the same spiel I do in all the other videos here. Uh, so you see, starts up, seems to play fine. Um, one of the things I always mention uh, is that original Game Boys did not support transparency. So if you wanted an object on screen to be transparent, um, you had to get creative. A lot of original devs that were working on this stuff figured out pretty early on uh, that the original screens also really sucked and the pixel response on them was just terrible. So you could just flicker a sprite on and off and that would achieve a nice transparency and bonus uh, it can save on resources depending on what specifically you're doing. Um, for example, the Game Boy has a limit on how many sprites you can have on screen at a single time. Um, resolution notwithstanding. But if you flicker a sprite on, on the alternating frame, you can flicker that sprite off and then flicker another one on. And then you can, you know, just alternate back and forth between them. The downside is they're going to be transparent, but the upside is you can effectively double your sprite limit. Um, 
But as you can see here, I'm playing uh, totally distracted. Uh, the entire background of this game is transparent. As you can see, it's doing a very darn good job of not flickering. That is this option here, frame mix, and that defaults to on. If I set that off, you can see my screen is now a flickery jumble mess. Um, if you're the, the type who only plays Pokemon on your Game Boys, you will almost never notice this. Um, but if you are playing this game in particular, you will notice this very frequently. Um, a lot of games use transparency effects for certain objects on screen. Uh, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening and DX are my usual go-to examples, though this one in particular I like because it's especially egregious. You can, you can really see what's going on when it's not working right. I'm going to turn that back on just for my own sanity because it's really hard to look at how much flickering that is there. Um, so they've effectively just re-implemented a feature that they have in a lot of their other kits. Uh, as far as I can tell, they um, totally lost my train of thought. I got distracted trying to play this game. So let's turn it off. Okay, so as far as I can tell, this FRM feature, um, not necessarily reverse engineered, but certainly inspired by... Yeah, you knew it was coming. Um, it is the most fair comparison. Yes, these are both FPGA consoles. Yes, they both take real cards. If you have a choice between the two, like genuinely, you 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 know, you, you have someone offering here, I'll give you one of these and a hundred dollars, or one of these, this is almost always gonna be the better option. So I really like what Funny Playing is doing here. I think they're I think they've done an excellent job, um, but the emulation isn't perfect. It just straight doesn't work with some... Uh, that's not what I meant to do. It just straight doesn't work with some games, and um, it is what it is. The Analog Pocket, on the other hand, uh, the firmware is... They, they've, they've got a lot more um, commit history under their belts, and the firmware tends to work a little bit more reliably in that... It is compatible with more games such as flashcards. Um, in my personal opinion, if you're getting hardware like this to use with hardware like this, you're wasting your time because you would be better served by buying one of the other 8 million emulator devices on the market. Um, like, there are plenty of things that play these games totally fine. Um, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance, they're not very complex systems as far as emulation goes. Darn near anything can emulate them. In fact, whatever you're watching this video on, I guarantee you can emulate Game Boy with zero problems. Um, so, if you're looking at this going, yeah, I really want to buy a Game Boy emulator to use with my cart emulator, you're barking up the wrong tree. It works on the analog pocket, but the analog pocket is more the exception than the rule in this case. Um, though, it is worth mentioning, it does work on my hardware. Um, it has to do more with... Oh, oh, there it goes, okay. It has to do more with the physical cartridge that you have. Uh, so if you're buying one of these to use with your, your flash cart, and your flash cart doesn't work, it's your flash cart. It's not the Game Boy. Yeah, it, it is kind of annoying that the compatibility works that way, but that's how it works. That's 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 the way the world goes. Um, as you can see, mine is not doing a very good job at loading. Oh, but it does go. It's just slow. Let's see if the game works. I still have it in Game Boy mode despite booting a Game Boy Color game. Seems to be working, actually. Let's see if it crashes in a fight. I think it was doing that before. No. 
Well, there you go. Let's try this again, but in GBC mode. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't even have to reset to the EverDrive menu, but it's working just the same as it was. I'm now sitting here realizing how frustrating it must be for me to sit here showing off how it's working totally fine. And then, you know, also saying that don't expect it to work on yours because it probably won't. And yet here mine is working totally fine. Um, but again, please trust me, it is like the firmware has come a very, very long way. It does not work in this. Watch it work. Of course. Of course. Because why not? Uh, let's also try out an Ever easy flash. Oh, this flash cart is an EverDrive GBX7. It is the older revision with the button under the label instead of at the top. For what it's worth. And of course the Easy Flash is working on this one too. <laughs> Older firmware runs a little bit slower, don't don't mind that. But yeah, as you can see, it's it's it is working. This is prototype firmware before they even started adding version numbers. In this particular case, I think I've only got one sound channel and it's running at like 80% the speed it's supposed to or something like that. But of course it works. Um, but yeah, point being, it's your cart. Either your cart works or it doesn't. And as you can see, my Easy Flash doesn't work. Just the EverDrive. But I bet I try that same thing on this Easy Flash and it works. Different name, but same game. I think the other one was 2.55, but this one's 2.51. Yeah, doesn't matter, same thing. Um, one thing to check if this happens to you, of course, once the console locks up, so too does the OSD, you gotta power it off. I'm gonna reset it with the game out of the cart slot so that I can get into the OSD. And I'm gonna bring the last option down here, clock speed down one notch. Try it again. Hmm? 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 Nah. Okay, so yeah, it just doesn't like easy flashes. Which might be fixed in the near future. I have heard a rumor that they have resolved Easy Flash Jr. incompatibilities in a future firmware update, but that day is not today. Okay, and last, let's take a look at one more feature, which I need the 240p test suite to properly demonstrate. Uh, GB test run. Alright, uh, well actually let's talk about two things. First, let's make sure we're actually getting both channels, so left pulse, right pulse, and we're good. We're actually getting both channels this time, which was a thing with earlier firmware. But nonetheless, uh, what I actually wanted was the stopwatch. I'm going to start that. You can compare this with the counter on the video to see what the uh, clock speed is at. I genuinely don't know. I don't know what each of these steps is. But as I slow it down, you should see the, the, the time between seconds getting a little bit longer. As you can see, the steps are not very big at all. 
That or it requires a save, I don't remember. It's also entirely possible that it's broken on this firmware version, because that doesn't seem right to me. But I don't know, I think that's about it. Um, overall, this is really cool. This is really neat. Like this whole build, not counting the buttons, um, is like less than $100. You get the motherboard, you get the screen assembly, you get the battery, you get the shell, you get your buttons, you get your membranes, and you put it together and it's a 100% aftermarket Game Boy that just kind of works. Granted, I, I really think this type of product is for someone who has a big collection of physical carts because that's what it's designed for. That's what it works best with. Your mileage may vary. You might get lucky. It might work totally fine with your flash cart. But if you're looking at one of these things with the intent of using it with your flash cart, please, 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 please just do yourself a favor and get something like this instead. Trust me, it's gonna be such a better experience. There's so many more features, it's so much more reliable than having to deal with, oh, is it gonna work with my flash cart today? Oh, who knows? Um, it's not gonna eat your saves or anything like that, which by the way, I have not heard of any issues with these, uh, these things eating saves. It's more the SD cards that um, corrupt in the flash cart and then you lose your saves from that. But it is what it is. Anyway, yeah, I, I think it's good. Is it worth it compared to an analog pocket? Well, I mean, they're, they're different devices for different use cases. I think the analog pocket is probably the best console pre-built that you can buy as long as you're getting one at MSRP. If you want to actually use it for carts, that is. Um, if you don't care about the cart compatibility, then the analog pocket still has a really kick-ass display. I really, really like this screen. It is very good. The um, screen filter modes are even better. Um, I think they're coming out with a few more in uh, just a few weeks. We'll see. There was some teasing about some something about CRT modes. Oh, we'll see about that. Um, I don't know. I like it. Genuinely good display. Uh, is that how we do brightness? Yeah, it is. Huh? Huh? I don't know. If you can get one of these at MSRP, it's the better buy, I think. That being said, these are usually a little bit more available. I know right now, as of filming, uh, these are currently sold out from Funny Playing Direct because they are working on a hardware revision to fix a few small um, hardware-related issues. Uh, one of them being updating on platforms that aren't Windows, um, I don't know what else they're doing. I think that's, like, that's the only thing that, I, that I've that i confirmed as far as what they're doing with the new hardware revision. I wouldn't expect any major differences, though. Um, I've speculated on that, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speculate here. Um, your guess is as good as, as good as mine. So, last thing, let's talk about updating. Um, updating requires a Windows PC. These should come out of the box totally working. You shouldn't need to update it. That being said, if you're a tinkerer, let me go ahead and... Oh boy, let's finish setting up my PC, huh? We're gonna not do that. Pro tip, if you actually just walk through the wizard, even if you don't accept any of the settings, it doesn't bug you again. Uh, there we go. Excellent. We need a Windows computer for updating. It's just kind of how this works. Um, you don't need any apps or anything installed. It just, it literally has to be a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 device. Uh, and it should just work for you. So what I've done, I have uploaded... Uh, thanks, Microsoft. Appreciate you. Um, I have updated all of the firmwares into a GitHub repository, at least all of the firmwares as of today. And I'm filming this. Uh, it's December 19th. Um, 
these are all of the firmwares that Funny Playing has given me for testing and then a few extras that they never actually gave me for testing. I don't know why, um, but they gave me the firmwares when I asked if I could just host them. So we have extra firmwares. Uh, so unfortunately, these are all effectively test versions. There's a write-up on all this stuff if you want to go through it, though chances are by the time you click on this repository, things are going to change. Uh, so I'm not going to bother going through all of that. What you want to do, go up here to code, hit download zip, and then you'll just get the whole package in a zip file that you can open up and extract wherever you want. Um, in this particular case, I have already dragged and dropped that over to my desktop, so I'm not going to do that again. Um, that being said, if you just want a specific firmware version, you can also just go into the folder, click on update.bin, and then click raw, and then uh, it'll download for you. Updating. Take your game out, switch your console on, plug it in over uh, USB. You'll see a drive pop up. In this case, I have Funny Playing D. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my folder here. And I'm going to update to the uh, November 17th firmware here. As you can see, my device is on V0.88. I'm gonna go ahead and click and drag this over. And then as soon as I do that, the screen goes black. And you can see it's copying. It goes a little bit slow. Oftentimes I see it get hung up at 27%. We'll go over that in just a second. But once it completes, the Game Boy reboots and you're just done. Like it's it's updated. Now if I go into the OSD, you can see I am on V0.89 now. Uh, I don't have a full list of all of the changes, but one of the changes that I know of offhand is a sleep mode. So if you press and hold the button, it sets the console to sleep. Granted, it's not a very low power state, so you'll only get, um, I think I clocked the battery life of this thing at like four to six hours, and in sleep, it's like six to eight hours. It's really not that much better. But what it does do is it does pause the game. Um, it pauses the game, it turns off all inputs, it turns off the display, you do get a little bit of power savings out of it. Um, but for games that you can't normally pause, this might be a, this might be a good deal. Um, one interesting thing that I just noticed, I never noticed this before until, until the video, but let me go and wipe this off. And you can see, maybe, that it's still on, there's just no backlight. So let's wake that up, turn it off. I'm gonna put game in there. No, I'm gonna put something that is moving in there. Switch that back to GB mode. Reset that. And I just want to get in game and then try and sleep it again. It is sleeped and this time the screen isn't on. So this time it actually shut off. It might've just been a, um, oh no, it's still there. It's just paused, I can see it. That's fascinating. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to capture this, but you'll have to take my word for it. It is, it is on. Anyway, um, it seems to work pretty well in my experience and I like, I genuinely like that it pauses the game. Like I could just pause this game normally, it doesn't matter, but not all games are pausable. I don't know of any offhand, but I'm sure something like that exists. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's besides the point, back to updating. So let's say, plug this in, I'm gonna try updating. You drag this over. I am going to set that over there, focus so you can see what I'm doing. I'm gonna drag this over, drop it on that, but then I'm gonna stop that upload. I just wanted it to copy enough to set my Game Boy into a bricked state because I want to show what happens next. So this is what a failed update looks like. You just, you turn it on, lights are on, but nobody's home. I'm fairly certain the backlight is on, though I can't actually tell. Yeah. 
miracle of a clear shell, right? Um, yeah, that's it. Totally unresponsive. Nothing can be done about it. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, there is a microcontroller that um, handles the updates for this thing. So even though the lights are on but nobody's home, the microcontroller is still totally functional. So you just switch it back on, plug it back in, and then there's our update drive, and we can try that again. So if you're trying to update yours and it gets stuck at any point, usually about 27%, um, yeah, of course it just worked fine for me. Um, power the console off. You see the drive unmounts. Power it back on. The drive remounts. And you can try and update again. Just, just try that a few times. Um, if it's not working for you, it needs to be a Windows PC for now. Uh, Funny Playing has found a workaround in the firmware for Linux machines. It is currently untested on Mac OS devices, so... Um, I don't know, if you've got a Linux machine, you're probably good to go to update it. If not, then, well, find a Windows machine or just don't update it. You can probably borrow a friend's or go to a library or something. You don't, you don't need to install any apps. It just, it has to be Windows 10. I tested Windows 8.1, does not work. Um, I tested Linux, Mac OS, and Chrome OS, Chromebook, Chrome OS, whatever. Uh, you know what I mean? The, the, the Chromium-based Linux nonsense. None of that works. It has to be Windows 10 or newer. Um, I'd sus I suspect it has to be a build from at least 2017. I suspect the 2015 or the 2016 and earlier builds will not work. But if you're still on one of those, um, well, you need more help than that. Just for context, here is the build that I'm on. I'm on 22H2 of Windows 10. Uh, OS build 19045.3803. Uh, it just updated today, but I've also, I don't regularly use this thing, so that update might have come out a month ago or even sooner. But um, I did install Windows 10 within the last few days, so maybe not that old. Um, anyway, that should be it. It should be good. Uh, the new hardware update should solve the updating issue on Linux devices. I don't know if it'll work on Mac OS devices, unfortunately. So if you've got a newer Mac that's on the Apple Silicon, sorry about the bad luck, but you're not updating, not for now at least, um, unless the bug is actually fixed on Apple as well. There are two entirely separate issues where it doesn't work on Linux and Mac OS. Like, those aren't the same issue. Um, even though it sounds like it, they're, it's weird. Um, I don't know. I found a workaround, but because Funny Playing also found their workaround, I'll, I'll let them fix it and try not to add confusion out there in the world. Um, but if you want to tinker with it on your own, it involves remounting the removable drive without sync or with sync. I don't remember. Uh, it defaults to one or the other. You just flip it over and remount it. Um, you also turn off the trash file creation, and I think that's it. I believe I had to copy with terminal using rsync, I don't remember, and I think I had to do it twice. Something like that. I wrote down the instructions, but I don't know. If if you're a Linux user, you can probably figure it out from there. Um, and if not, then that doesn't apply to you anyway. Uh, but anyway, I think that's about all I've got. I will go ahead and compile this video, get it uploaded, and um, we should be good to go from there. So yeah, the, these things are super cool. I really like them. I really think it's cool. I'm glad to see the market going this way because yeah, Game Boy Colors are cool, but the hardware is kind of limited. There's only so much you can do by bolting stuff onto this thing. At some point you need to start interjecting um, within the actual electrical processes in the CPU if you want to have it behave a little bit differently. Um, for example, if you just want it to ha want to drive a different screen without having to have a interposer, well, you need to replace the CPU for that. So that's, that's what's nice about this. In my opinion, the modding scene has, has um, advanced so much that we're kind of out of hardware mods that we can do, and at this point, everything needs to be done in silicon if you want to 
if you want to keep going. But that that's just my speculation. I think, all I'm saying is I think we've reached the limit for what we can do with this hardware without replacing even more of the hardware. And I think that's pretty cool. I especially like the lack of dependence upon um, 20 plus year old things that people have had kicking around in their attic. Um, it's not it's not 100% there yet. Like this isn't a drop in replacement for a Game Boy. I know that's the intention and for like, mm, I don't wanna say a percentage because I haven't actually tested that many, but for every game I've tested, it does seem to work fine aside from, like I said, sometimes you have to pop into this menu, change the core mode and then change the display mode. But beyond that, it has worked with every single game that I've tested except for the Nintendo Power Cart. Um, but that doesn't seem to be enough of a common uh, cart to be a big deal. The other thing is if you're the type that likes these, um, you know, Game Sharks, Code Breakers, whatever, they're not compatible for, for different reasons. Um, that's new. So in, yeah, it's the cart slot itself just physically does not want to accept one of these. You can kind of force it and jam it in. Um, but even if you do, this one in particular doesn't actually work. So that's a bad example. Uh, but this one does. And... I'll have to find my magic brain or whatever the hell it is. Um, I don't know if I ever got this one working. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, if you wanna use those things, you're gonna have a bad time. Sorry about that. Uh, there is a physical incompatibility. I believe they've fixed the software so that it actually works properly with the software, at least with the magic brain. I have not tested the code breaker or the Game Shark since they've had updates. But uh, I'll save that for another time because this video is already ridiculous. I planned for this to be 15 minutes long and here we are an hour and a half later or something like that. Um, no, nah, I, I think it's pretty good. I think with a few more firmware updates once they've got um, a little bit more, a little bit more of the bugs ironed out, I think it'll be pretty good. Oh, totally forgot. Um, this thing does support simultaneous charge and play. Let me get my power cord here. So we can use this thing with type C hosts. It doesn't have to be a type A host. You plug it in and well, that's about all you get. These things charge at a very low rate, unfortunately. So as you can see from my meter here, it's pulling five volts and about 460 milliamps, um, so five volts, 500 milliamps, uh, which, yeah, that's the USB 2.0 spec. I suspect Funny Playing did this intentionally because they figured people are gonna be plugging it into their computer for updates and they don't want it drawing more power during an update. Um, I don't know why they did it that way, but sure, fine. Um, if you turn it on, the console does draw a little bit more power. Now it's pulling about 700 milliamps at five volts. Um, yeah, it's, it's not very fast. It's fast enough, but it's not very fast. Uh, if you plug this thing into, ooh, my camera cut off. I'm sorry about that. I don't know exactly where it cut off because I just immediately started re-recording. Um, yeah. If you plug this thing into charge, expect it to charge for like four hours if it's completely dead. It it, it genuinely does take a long time and that's just kind of how they work, unfortunately. Um, nice thing is, slower charging is much easier on the battery than faster charging is. So uh, it should help with longevity if you plan on keeping this thing around for a few years. Ah, excuse me. Um, Otherwise, I think that's about it. Um, obviously, it supports headphones too, but I can't really test that on video because, you know, they're headphones, they go in my ears. It sounds totally fine. Um, 
I have mentioned this in the older videos on the prototypes that I've covered, but I did not mention it in this one because I totally forgot. But as I'm sure you can tell, the audio is much, much louder than stock. So if I take, I cannot believe I put them away. Yes, I have Crystalis here, which I like because that intro score is just a straight banger. Ooh, that's running slow. Oh, I still have the clock speed down. Let's bump that up a little. It still sounds a little slow. I can't tell. Eh, that sounds about right. But yeah, as you can tell, nice and loud. I like it. It's pretty good. Uh, though there is one caveat. I'm going to go ahead and turn the volume down now. And hopefully you can pick up this static noise. I don't know exactly where the microphone is. just waved it in front of both sides of the phone. Hopefully it got that. Um, there, There is just straight static noise that comes out of the speaker when you have this thing on, regardless of what your volume level is at. It's very quiet. Um, and so the minimum volume level is set in such a way that it masks that noise that it makes. So if you have volume on, you won't hear any of the noise. The downside is the minimum volume level is almost louder than the maximum volume level of a regular Game Boy. Uh, so if you like playing these things and you like having the volume on, uh, get used to it being loud. You can try muffling it if you want. That's the easy workaround, but that's not gonna do anything good for your uh, sound quality. Um, I know a few different people are looking into it. Maybe we'll do some mods if Funny Playing never make some adjustments in software, but that's for another time. Um, otherwise, I think that's about it. I will go ahead and throw some links in the description if you want to check out my other videos on the older versions of this hardware, including the original prototype and then the retail version that ended up not being the retail version. Um, I'll also go ahead and throw some links down in the description to Retro Game Repair Shop. Uh, they were the ones who provided this specific hardware version to me. Um, they gave me the, the shell and the uh, kit. Um, wow, totally lost my train of thought. That's, that's what I get for recording such a long video. Um, I'll go ahead and link to Retro Game Repair Shop down in the description if you want to grab one of these. Uh, right now, only Funny Playing and Retro Game Repair Shop carry these things, and Funny Playing is currently out of stock. Um, that should change as soon as they've made their hardware revision, but I have no idea how long that's going to take. And with Chinese New Year coming up pretty soon, it might be a little bit, might be a little bit delayed unless they rush to put out before then, and then yeah, I don't know. We'll see. From my understanding. It sounds like they're done with the new hardware revision and they're just testing the bootloader firmware on Mac OS. And then once they've tested, maybe they'll ship. Who knows? I don't know. Um, that's just speculation. I need to stop speculating because I'm going to go upload this video on the internet and then uh, there will be evidence of my foolishness. But whatever. Doesn't matter. You guys have come to expect nothing less at this point, am I right? But anyway, yeah, thanks to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending this my way to check out. Um, links in the description if you want to check out other videos, and uh, I'll catch you all next time. Thanks for watching. And I don't care what Analog's marketing says, FPGAs are still emulation. And, and if you disagree with me, we, we can have words, you know. I'll, I have a very compelling argument. Um, 
look up the definition of what the word emulation means. And again, emulation is not inherently bad. Bad emulation is inherently bad. This is not bad emulation for most games. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, that's enough. I'll catch you all next time. And um, I'll probably do another one of these videos when the new hardware revision drops. So hopefully it won't be a month or two behind. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, bye for now.